let's start with some basic ideas. Who here knows who is in control of Bitcoin? Who here thinks no one is in control of Bitcoin? Quite a few people. All right. So this is the fundamental issue at the heart of many of the debates we're having today. The debates about governance, the debates about scaling. Who is in charge? Bitcoin expresses a new thing, a thing that has rules without rulers. And for people, this is a very confusing concept, because most everything we've seen before, rules come from rulers. And you trust the rules because you trust the rulers, what we call appeal to authority. Of course, appeal to authority is known as a cognitive bias. It is a bug in our brain software. It makes us discard logic and reasoning in favor of attribution and authority. It makes us associate as tribes, teams, and political parties, and make decisions based on whether the person expressing authority or ideas is part of our tribe or part of the enemy tribe. And we all know that the enemy tribe has always been an enemy, is up to no good, and is trying to destroy this beautiful world. Always. The problem is, of course, that everybody who belongs to the enemy tribe thinks that we are up to no good, <laughs> and we are trying to destroy the world. You see this emerging in every sphere of human existence. And of course, you see it emerging in the conversations around Bitcoin and many of the other open blockchains. People find it very difficult to accept the idea that a system can exist with rules and without rulers, a system without authority, a system in which it doesn't matter who is most popular or what opinions they have, because they are unable to change the rules. And I think that was demonstrated resolutely just a couple of weeks ago, uh, culminating, of course, two days ago, when the rules were not changed. Again, the rules were not changed. And this time, there was a very large group of people who had a different opinion about the rules. Their opinion was not right. Their opinion was not wrong. Their opinion was opinion. And in Bitcoin, opinions are not judged based on who holds them. What matters is whether they can reach consensus with the overwhelming majority of participants in the system. And if they cannot reach consensus with the overwhelming majority of the people in the system, it doesn't matter how much money they have, how much authority they have, how much popularity they have. And that's how it should be. Now, a lot of people looked at what happened a week ago and said, OK, Bitcoin Core won. Victory. Which is not true. Bitcoin Core did not win. Bitcoin Core happened to be with the side of consensus, or at least with the size of the status quo. And if you don't have overwhelming majority to change the rules, the system ensures that the rules remain the same. So all you have to do in the system is follow the rules, the rules that exist today. And if you want to change the rules, you'd better have overwhelming consensus, otherwise the system will punish you financially in many cases. And everyone who tries to change the rules without overwhelming majority loses. Core didn't win. They just didn't try to change the rules without overwhelming consensus, and as a result, the rules were not changed. We will see these battles happen again and again and again. In fact, the battles we see so far are tiny 
compared to what's coming. Ivan talked about creating regulations so that people can trust and invest and participate without fear. Regulations are the way we used to run governance in systems where there are rulers, because regulations are created by regulators. Those are rules with rulers. Good news is they can't change the rules of Bitcoin because they do not have consensus. There will be regulations, but there will be regulations only of the systems surrounding open blockchains, not of open blockchains themselves, because open blockchains themselves already are regulated by mathematics, by overwhelming consensus, by network-based rules. These are not systems without regulations. These are systems with very predictable, deterministic, clear, transparent regulations based on mathematics. Regulations not subject to political power, not subject to compromise, discussion, change. And that is why this system is special. It is special precisely because it cannot be changed or subject to political will. Now, a lot of people don't like that. They don't like the existence of a system that is fundamentally supranational and outside of the traditional controls of political power. They don't have to use it. I will. And the system will not change to subject itself to the whim of those who do not like the idea of a system that is outside of traditional governance and regulatory structures. The whole point of the system is that it is outside. The whole point of the system is that it will not be subject to traditional regulations. You can regulate your country out of Bitcoin, but you cannot regulate Bitcoin out of your country. And many countries will regulate themselves out of Bitcoin, and out of Ethereum, and out of all of the other open blockchains. And they will end up getting the benefit of the closed blockchains, the controlled blockchains, the regulated government's safe blockchains. I don't want safe. I want free. I want innovative. I want global, transnational, neutral, censorship resistant. And I will continue to use the system that expresses those principles, and through my choice, I will participate in the consensus rules without rulers. These systems will not be regulated. And the problem is that when you present the world with a system that cannot be regulated through traditional political power, this will not go down easily. A fantastic quote by Clay Shirky comes to mind. Organizations that exist to solve a problem are resistant to fixing the problem. <laughs> Bitcoin fixes the problem without the organizations to solve it, without the intermediaries. A lot of people see these open blockchains and immediately assume that these will disrupt banking, finance, payment networks. I thought so too. And yet the surprising thing is that the first thing disrupted by open blockchains is regulation itself and regulators, governance and governments. It disrupts the idea of hierarchical, representative, top-down, jurisdiction, geographic-based regulation. You cannot decide how these systems will operate within your borders because they are not within your borders. They do not see borders. And this makes many people very, very uncomfortable. This is a test. It is not a test for Bitcoin. It is not a test for open blockchains. It is a test of democracy. It is a test of self-determination. It is a test of freedom of expression. It is a test of freedom of association. 
some governments will fail that test. Some governments will be intrinsically suspicious of a system that empowers citizens, residents, just people, to use money to engage in commerce without interference, without censorship, without control. And many governments will fail that test. They will violate the principles that they claim to hold true, because for the first time, those principles will be tested by a network that will force them to reckon with these principles. Governance is not something that will be added to Bitcoin. It is not something that will be added to open blockchains. It is something that open blockchains already do in a new way, in a different way, in a way that will not change to suit the old way. That is the fundamentally disruptive potential of this technology. Now, in this entire system, there are going to be a lot of debates and a lot of disagreements. There are many choices to be made, choices at every step as to how to solve technology, scale, and architecture problems, how to make the system more robust, more resilient, cheaper, more secure, faster, and able to absorb billions of people who will need to use systems like this. And right now, we can't do it. Right now, the open blockchains we have today cannot support the population that might need to use them. That's okay. This is still the prototype. This is the nine-year-old. Right? The nine-year-old is still going to school, <laughs> still learning how to be in the world. And if you have spent any time with a nine-year-old, you will know that it is pretty awkward, unsure, unsteady at times, temperamental, throws a tantrum every now and then. And that is how this technology is going to be for quite a while. That doesn't mean it can't scale. That doesn't mean it can't change. It will. And you can see within this nine-year-old body, you can see the future potential. You can see the image of what this person might be, or what this technology might be, to stretch the metaphor. But it's not there yet. And it's important to separate what we have today with what is possible in the future. A lot of people assume that the scalability we have today will simply extrapolate on a linear basis. I recently read this on Twitter. Someone said, well, if it costs five to ten dollars to do a transaction today, then in ten years, when there's a billion people, it will cost a hundred dollars to do a transaction, and then it will be impossible to use for most people. If it takes an hour to send a JPEG over the internet in 1990, then when everybody is sending JPEGs over the internet in 2017, it will take ten days to send a JPEG over the internet. That is not how scalable exponential systems work. But in changing the scale of the system, we have to think about what compromises and trade-offs are being made. And this is a decision everybody has to make. You are all participants in these open blockchains. If you run the software, if you choose a wallet, if you choose an exchange, you are choosing how the system will evolve. You are, through your actions, through your spending, through your choices, participating in the formation of the consensus rules of the future. And you have to think carefully about convenience versus liberty. Do we want a system that is cheap, or do we want a system that is free? We might have to go through a period where the system is expensive. That is okay. That is not forever. It is not a permanent state of affairs. Today, it is a lot harder to use Bitcoin for everyday transactions, like buying a cup of coffee, than it was in 2013. 
there is a reason for that. And the reason is that now we are trying to do it on a much greater scale, with a lot more demand. And it won't be like this forever. Already there are many ways to improve the scalability, performance, security, and speed of the system. If you read the debates online, this is presented as most questions are, not just as a binary choice between A and B, but more importantly, as a Manichaean choice between good and evil. One choice is obviously the best way to go. The other is obviously an Illuminati plot to destroy the world. Some people will even go as far as to say that both choices are an Illuminati plot to change the world, in which case, take two steps back from that person. <laughs> they might be dangerous. In my opinion, both sides of the raging debate we've seen about scale are doing what's best in their mind to scale this network. I know many of the people who participate in these debates. I know them personally. I spent time working with them. I have been working with them or acquainted with them since 2012. Some of the most hated personalities in Bitcoin are the people who gave me my first Bitcoin, who introduced me to this, who helped me at my first conference, who helped me writing my book. People who I honestly and truly believe are doing the best they can for the thing they believe in. We must not forget that we all share one thing in common, and that is we love the idea of freeing the world from monopoly money, of freeing the world from monopoly banking, of bringing economic participation to seven and a half billion people. That is the thing we all have in common. We can disagree about the how, we can disagree about the when, but let's not forget that's what we want. It's very easy to assume that people are motivated immediately and easily by money. And don't get me wrong, money corrupts people. And sometimes it does so in subtle and slow ways. But let's not assume that everybody who is making money in this space, who has a job, who has a profession, an income, who is affiliated with a company, can be so easily manipulated as to form the basis of their opinions entirely based on who pays them. That is appeal to authority. It is appeal to authority of their employer. And that is just as mistaken as any other form of appeal to authority. Scaling is a difficult problem. The answers are not simple, because the questions are not simple. Can we scale? Yes. But it matters how we scale. Because some ways of scaling have side effects. Side effects that, at least in our community, are very dangerous. Centralization of control is the biggest side effect of any scaling choice. And we have to be very, very careful to ensure that, as these systems scale, we preserve the most important principles. The openness, the neutrality, the censorship resistance, the decentralization. We avoid the concentration of power and control. And decentralization isn't a boolean. It's not an on-off. It's not a yes versus no. It's a scale. Is Bitcoin fully decentralized? It's not. Is it one of the most decentralized things, especially in finance, to ever happen? It is. How can we make sure that in the future it is at least as decentralized as it is today, or better? At least as private as it is today, or better? At least as open as it is today, 
or better. I talked about rules without rulers, and yet there are many people who want to take the role of ruler, who want to dictate rules, who want to take control. It's a natural inclination of the human species to see the absence of rulers as an opening, a job opening, an invitation to ascend to the throne. We have to resist that. And we fall most prey to that when we make simplistic assessments of other people's opinions, associate those opinions with their employer, assign them as ultimate evil, and condemn them to the opposing side. Because what we do then is simultaneously reflect that back on the people we do believe in, and we just softly and subtly push them into taking that throne. There are going to be a lot of people who try to introduce themselves as intermediaries in a system that is designed to remove intermediaries, who will try to hold your keys for your own safety, who will try to ensure that only good people can do transactions. Will somebody please think of the children? I do think of the children. I want the children to live in a world where seven and a half billion people have access to an open economy. I want to live in a future where everyone can participate, and more importantly, a world in which we do not allow others to make choices about who is good and who is evil. Because I don't believe in Santa Claus. And if you give someone the opportunity to make a list of the good kids and the bad kids, that gives them ultimate power. As an adult, maybe you read the story of Santa Claus, and you realized that he's a fascist dictator. <laughs> no one elected him. <laughs> what a patriarchy! How did this happen? Oh my God! We just assigned randomly a red-robed dude with a white beard to decide for the children of the entire world which are evil and which are good? Let's not do that again. People will attempt to introduce controls to say that we shouldn't allow everyone to use these systems, because bad people may use them. We shouldn't allow everyone to transact and use money, because bad people will use money. And again, that fundamental splitting of the world in Manichaean terms between good and evil creates rulers, creates power. And as soon as power is created, power is abused. My philosophy is simpler. Not most people agree with me. I don't think there is absolute good or absolute evil. I think good people do evil things all the time. Occasionally, evil people might do good things. People change. But more importantly, one of the worst things we can do is give someone else the control over that decision. We will scale. We will grow Bitcoin. We will grow all the open blockchains. And they will be attacked. They will be attacked as ideas. The networks will be attacked. The currencies will be attacked. They will be attacked financially. They will be attacked legally. In some countries, they will be attacked violently. In many cases, deadly attacked. People who participate in these systems today are risking their lives in at least a handful of countries around the world. I have spoken to a few people who are using Bitcoin in Venezuela, who do it under extreme risk. 
but that risk is worth it because the greater risk is that they lose the ability to give their family a future, and so they're willing to take that risk. There will always be someone willing to take that risk. If your government bans access to open finance, you really, really, really need to get yourself some Bitcoin. <laughs> That's exactly when you need this system most. It's hard to explain that in places like Scandinavia. What do you need Bitcoin for? You don't. This is one of the most cashless societies in the world. You have access to banking, unless you're an immigrant or refugee who is undocumented, or a Bitcoin company, or a Bitcoin company that's been <laughs> shut down by the banks. Most people who come to these events they don't need Bitcoin. I hope you will see why it is necessary for everyone else in the world. One of the things that is common in countries with strong democratic institutions, with equitable and fair governments, with strong cultural bonds, with a society that is progressive, is that people who live in countries like that want everyone to live like that. So you don't need Bitcoin. But how about everybody else gets what you have? And the problem is that banks cannot do that. And they cannot do that because banks concentrate power in the boardroom, in the cabinets, in the parliaments. Your boardrooms, your cabinet, your parliament is benign. There are 194 countries out there. Most of them do not have that. Most of them will probably never have that. And part of the reason is because those political systems can control money. And if they control money, they can control democracy or eradicate it. Control over money is an enormous power. Most countries should have separation of state and money, just like separation of church and state. It seems logical. It is not the case in most of the world. The countries that need this technology the most cannot trust their government, cannot trust their banks. They do not have the social institutions to deliver prosperity and liberty at scale as Sweden does. Which means that as early users of this technology, the choice you make between convenience and liberty will affect billions. Thank you.